morning will be taking over the rain. So I'm super excited this morning to introduce two phenomenal women whom I've known for a very long time, one being very, very long time, Jamie Tate. Um, but I'm pretty sure I introduced the two of you, Julie and Jamie, um, a while ago. And I know that there are so many synergies within your businesses. And so um, I'm super excited to hear um, what you have to say this morning. So I'd like to introduce you both. First, Julie Keys from Key Strategies. Julie is the founder and owner of Key Strategies LLC and has been an entrepreneur the majority of her life. As the founder and operator of several companies, she understands and keeps an owner up at night and the balancing act required to work both in and on the business. I think we can all relate to that. Having outside perspective and mentoring made all the difference for her she spent years growing and improving her companies before selling and become, becoming a business advisor in 2011. Um, Julie is also now an author. She recently released her first book, Poised for Exit, A Woman, Woman Entrepreneur's Guide to Business Transition. Um, and I need to get that book. I know I've been uh, waiting for it. So, And then also uh, with us this morning is Jamie Tate of Keystone Group International. Jamie started Keystone Group International in 2013 to take her experience and help drive growth in more organizations across the globe. Keystone is focused on leadership development and organizational strategy, growth, and change. Jamie believes that strong leadership and a change resilience culture is the foundation for sustainable growth for any business. She currently serves on the board of NABO Minnesota and Playworks Minnesota. Jamie also volunteers her time to mentor women who are starting their own businesses through a program at Women Venture. And I'm pretty sure Jamie also has a book um, on the horizon as well. So these are two fabulous women and um, like to take it, turn it over to Julie and Jamie. Perfect. Well, thanks, Mary. Um, I'll kick it off here for us. Um, you did a great job with the intro. Um, I'll let uh, Julie and I kind of, if there's anything, Julie, that you want to add to your intro, because I know that's a summary of all of the amazing things that you actually do. Um, but anything else that you would want to add for everybody? Check out the podcast show. Yeah. Yeah. We've got all that information at the end. Julie and I yeah. both do podcasts. Yeah. Awesome. I am in the messy middle of my first book is what I call it right now. <laughs> um, so it will be there at some point. Um, we're actually starting a second podcast, which hasn't been released yet. More information to come there. Um, I'm a mom of four teenagers. So if that just tells you anything while well, why I'm in the office, because this is my safe place and my sanity. Um, so I'm really glad to be here with all of you today. <laughs> we're surviving distance learning at this point. Well, thank you for being here this morning. So Here's our agenda, it's pretty simple. We've left a lot of time for questions and dialogue because I think especially as, as female business owners, we need to help each other share what we're dealing with. And I think that that helps some of these topics really um, hit home for us and for us to really understand. But our goal today is to share with you the current state um, and then share some statistics and trends and things that Julie and I are seeing and then talk about creating that foundation of resiliency. That's the big word right now is how does your business have resiliency to kind of come back or to thrive from here? And then some strategies to rebuild value. What do you need to be focusing on right, as a business owner in this new normal and kind of where things are going? And so that's our goal for our time today. Again, um, we'll be monitoring the chat. So and it's a small enough group. If you just want to pop in and ask a question as we're going, we're totally fine. We want to make sure that it's interactive. Um, and not just two talking heads up here because we don't have all the answers. We're just here to talk about our, you know, what we've seen to help. So I want to start with just kind of the current state of the state, right? It, it's an understatement to say that 2020 has been a challenging year for everybody. Um, and at this point, it's important to, to really understand and in, be informed on, on what our strategies need to be for 2021. And it's not that 2020 is a complete loss. There's still time, right, for, for things to happen. Um, but we need to really focus and figure out how we need to adjust and change for 2021, given that the new normal is different than where we were before. Um, and so to start that, I, I want to talk about just kind of the state of the state. 
um, in the current business landscape. It, with Julie and I, you know, we work with so many clients. I mean, Keystone's got 60 plus active clients right now in a variety of ways, but we just hear a lot, right, about the good, the bad, and the ugly and what's happening. And so um, we, we are kind of hearing and we're seeing what's happening on the ground. And so the first thing when we talk about the state of the states as, as women business owners and in business owners in general is we've got to get real about the state of business right now. Um, one of the biggest things that, that I'm struggling with right now with a lot of our clients is people who are, number one, either not continuing to use COVID as an excuse um, for what's happening, which it is, it's, it's not great, right? There's a lot, but if this is here to stay and this is going to be our new business landscape for a period of time, we've got to get real about what this looks like and how we need to adjust and change to it. Um, I think we went through the first kind of three, six months of just hoping it was going to go away. <laughs> and we've proven that it's not going to go away anytime soon. And, and there's also opportunities that are being created, which we'll talk about today as well. Um, the second piece is what we're calling survive to thrive. And what we really saw in March, April, and May when COVID hit was this adrenaline rush of sorts. Like it, it was scary and kind of fearful, but what a lot of businesses did is the team came together. We did just amazing superhero acts of figuring out how to be remote and do all of these amazing things. And we survived it. And it was like an adrenaline spike. And then June, July, August, and into September, we saw this huge, like we came off the sugar high, right? And we saw this huge dip in a lot of businesses in terms of energy. Um, the, the employees, the business owners were just like, oh, okay, I thought we were gonna be past this. And so we just need to acknowledge where we're at in that because our goal is to get back to thrive, right? So we kind of followed this adrenaline spike, we followed a dip and we, we need to get back to thrive and from an energy standpoint in our business. And what is that gonna take? What's it gonna take for our employees? And so making sure that we're really examining where we're at today and being honest with ourselves and our business and then deciding what it's gonna take to, to thrive again. And hopefully some of the content we're sharing with you today and some of the ideas will help you with that. And then as always, you know, crisis creates opportunity. Right. We know that, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste, right? Winston Churchill. And so with any crisis, we have to be looking at our businesses and saying, how can we think differently about what's going on? How can we be leading in some of these areas that are super unknown right now? And so if you don't know where the opportunity in your industry and in your business is right now, you need to find it. And that's a big piece of what Julie and I are seeing is the businesses that are finding those opportunities right now are poised and set up for success, right, in 2021 and as things return to normal, right, whatever normal looks like. Um, so having that optimism, but also making sure that we're really being honest and baseline where we're at today, but digging into to where we should be going. Julie, anything else that you would add to this slide? No, I think you set it up really good. That's what we're here to do is just to kind of help you think through um, what's next for you, um, you know, we're really just here to help be about the business of building your business or rebuilding your business. Yep. Yeah. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Julie to talk through some statistics and some trends that we're seeing kind of in the, in the, in the market today. Sure. So when it comes to statistics, um, we don't really have a lot of statistics right now. We have more trends than we have statistics, but we're going to talk through a few things that we do know. I think that what we could all agree to on is that what we do know <laughs> is that it's affected all of our businesses in some way. Um, even if we've had a really good year with um, record sales, you know, a lot of companies have been doing really well because of the industry that they're in. They've all had to pivot. Everybody's had to pivot. And even the clients that I have who are doing really well this year are really afraid um, of what the future will hold. They're they're concerned that there's going to be another outbreak. They're concerned that there'll be more restrictions on their business, um, <clears throat> that there could be another outbreak within their own businesses. Many of my clients have had that happen. And um, one of the statistics that we do know, and I got a lot of the numbers that I'm going to be sharing from uh, McKinsey Reports. McKinsey Reports is, does a really good job of um, pretty much monitoring everything. So if you're looking for information to help you make a decision, because I, that's what I use this stuff for, is not only to make decisions for my own business, but to help my clients make decisions. You know, what are the big companies doing? What, what are the trends? What's going on out there? You know, how do we uh, factor that into the decisions that we make? And one thing is that the pandemic 
has truly affected companies, right? So these statistics and these numbers are based on what we know right now and the effect that it's had on companies and that 49% of our employees are working from home. 51% are not. And so why is that a big deal? Well, it's a huge deal um, for a lot of reasons. And I'll give you a, for instance, um, one of my clients is a professional service company and they've reopened their office and they've redesigned how everyone is positioned in the office and many of their key people have their own office with their own door. And they have a couple people who are holdouts who don't wanna come in. They're not at home raising kids and doing homeschooling. That's another whole animal, right? Um, but they're not comfortable coming into the office and working in the office. They're working from home. Yet they complain that um, the, the, they don't feel like they're part of the team anymore. They feel disjointed. Um, and yet they're willing to go to happy hour. So how do you deal with that? Um, not quite sure. I, I think just continually <laughs> inviting them to come back into the office and, and work together with, with everybody. Um, but the whole working mother thing um, that's another whole issue that we really haven't seen shake out yet, but it's definitely going to affect companies across the board, large, medium, and small, because there are a lot of uh, key people out there who are women, um, leaders of companies, leaders of departments, who are having to make the choice of whether they stay home and homeschool their kids or whether they continue to work, because many cannot work from home. So those are the things that we know that we're dealing with right now. Um, one thing that I'd like to just touch on really quick um, is a concept called the five D's. And if you haven't heard of what the five D's are, um, every business at some point is affected by at least one of the five D's in their business life cycle. The vast majority of business owners will be affected by one or more than one the longer they're in business. Obviously, it increases your odds as you get older. Um, some of them have to do with health, so let's just name what they are. You got death, everybody's going to die. You have divorce, it happens more now than it has been, right? Um, you got disaster, and we've all been pretty much living through some form of disaster to a greater or lesser degree. And then there's disability. People get sick and they can't work. Um, and then there's disagreements between partners. Um, I just went through that with a couple of my clients, actually, buying out partners. So everybody's under a lot of stress right now. Not everybody can work from home. And so this particular statistic is one that I think we should all pay attention to because it's the effect of our workforce and how comfortable they are in um, you know, coming back to work, like I just highlighted in one of my client stories. Not everybody's comfortable coming into a workplace where they're gonna be in close proximity with other people. And if we're having a hard time finding good people to fill spots from people that we've either laid off and didn't come back or for whatever reason, or maybe we're just busy. Um, I've got some clients right now that are looking for people and finding good people is so tough. So it isn't just that we wanna you know, get by with the rules, right, and the compliance. We wanna like go over and above um, how uh, ways that we can um, get our message out there that we're keeping people safe, that we're not only OSHA compliant and DOL compliant, but that we have a really good, strong culture that fosters, um, you know, the best that we, uh, the best and brightest of the people that we are bringing in. And insurance, I forgot about that. So your insurance company might have a few. Um, requirements. So you just want to keep a pulse on that. So what we're doing right now is we're just kind of setting up, like Jamie said, we're talking about the state of the state. Where are we now? What have the problems been? Um, what are the biggest barriers to performance? Um, this historically has been a problem with many entrepreneurs, not just because of the pandemic, but, but really it's important for us to identify what's kind of getting in the way of us being able to move forward. It kind of reminds me of... Um, of a triptych. If you know what a triptych is, it's a piece of art. It's three pieces and it's, and it's continual, but they're broken up. So I kind of think about like our businesses as being this piece of art where it's a progressive thing, right? A triptych is a progressive thing, but there were, there's like a stop gap, right? There's a stop and there's a gap and we need to close it. And so we can continue to move forward. And some business owners are not. They're like Jamie alluded to, they're kind of treading water um, not really sure what to do next. And so they're making decisions very slowly, missing opportunities. Um, that lack of strategy, clarity, collaboration is huge, huge. So 
focus on collaboration. If you do anything new, focus on collaboration. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, but just to get out of that state of inertia, okay, what is it going to take for you to be able to do that? And are you? Maybe you're not. Maybe you're moving really well. You just want to get some clarity around what drives value and how can I close the value gap? We're going to talk about that in a little bit too. Um, but when it comes to making decisions, I think you just got to try to surround yourself with the best people, not only internally, but externally, having a really good, solid uh, team of advisors. And it starts with your financial advisor and your CPA. You have got to have good relationships with people like that on your team because they are gonna help you to make decisions going forward for not only the growth of your business, but for your own future. Perfect, thanks, Julie. So I want to talk about kind of what we call the foundation of resiliency. And so I, this is important anytime in your business, but it's especially important right now. And this is for your business and for your finances, but it's also for your mental health as a business owner, right? That we've got to figure out the things we can control and the things that will create a foundation for the next crisis, because we all know, right, they go in cycles. This won't be the last thing that impacts our business over the life of our business. And so we need to be thinking about that. We need to make sure that our business is strong. And so how do we create that foundation of resiliency? The, one of the first things that we recommend, um, and we've got a lot of great examples from our clients having gone through this, right, or especially over the last six to eight months, is doing a real SWOT analysis, right? Getting real around the strengths that you can exploit in your business, right? Each of our business has strengths, things that we are really good at that we're better than our competition at. How can you exploit those right now, right? There's a way to double down on some of those strengths to make you more revenue and to grow the business and to do it even in a crisis like this, right? There are businesses who are thriving and growing right now. We need to really examine our weaknesses and get real about what is, where, where does our business break down, COVID or not, right? Where are the processes not as efficient as they should be? Where is that profit erosion happening in our business where we're not making, right? The bottom line isn't as strong as we want it to be. So really thinking about that now before, you know, everything starts to pick up again because we know it will turn. And, and the analogy that I give with my clients is, you have two options when it turns. We don't all know when that's gonna be. We can either be in the blocks, ready to sprint, right? We having fixed some of these things that, that have been exposed in our business, or we can be standing at the start line with our shoes untied. And I know which one I wanna be, and I'm hoping my competition's got their shoes untied because when you're ready and we're not just, you know, in this space of like, woe is me, COVID is happening to my business, when you're ready to run, there's gonna be opportunities. So making sure we're working on our weaknesses now. Um, opportunities to plan for. We talked about that as crisis creates opportunity. Where are there areas in your market in a new industry, something different that you've never done before? Where are there opportunities for you to think differently about your business? And then threats to mitigate, right? In a traditional SWAT, threats are things we can't control, the threat itself, but we can control how we react to the threat, right? How we mitigate that threat in our business. And so um, thinking about those threats, even outside of the pandemic and everything else that's going on is what are the other threats to your business and how can you really create resiliency in your business, even if some of those threats come to fruition? So Julie, any examples that you wanna share with clients kind of in this SWAT space and, and where they've had some, some good um, forward progress during this time? Um, yeah, actually, I'm in the throes of revising SWOT analyses for all of my clients right now, going into 2021, um, just kind of rethinking everything and including my own business and working with uh, someone to help me through that. Um, I think that a cool exercise that you could try if you haven't done this already uh, is to have your key players, whoever it is that helps you put this SWOT together, um, kind of give them homework to go home and think about the business itself and to do their own SWOT analysis on the business, you know, top five strengths, top five weaknesses and so on. And then bring everybody together for a group meeting and everybody share what they came up with. And you just kind of whiteboard the whole thing, um, whether you have a facilitator like Jamie or me or not, um, but someone needs to kind of take charge of the meeting. So whoever that makes sense, uh, whoever it is that makes sense to do that, um, but somebody has got to facilitate it. 
Um, but you'll be you'll be surprised at what comes out of that when they're actually able to sit and, th and think about it themselves before they're asked. Because I've tried it both ways, where you know you get everybody in a room and you just go, okay, what are our strengths, right? And you start writing everything down. But many, I mean, even if they know ahead of time that you're going to be talking about it, being able to do it in private and then bringing it in can be really helpful. So give that a whirl. Um, another uh, uh, thing with regard to opportunities, really quick. Um, Making a strategic acquisition might be something that you think about right now as far as opportunities go. I think there are going to be a lot of businesses available, smaller businesses for roll-ups. Um, there's a lot to that. Could be a really good opportunity for growth. So just think about that. Um, and one, one thing with regard to threats, this is something that's going on right now with one of my clients. They're a property management company and they primarily work in um, multi-housing. And so a lot of these multi-housing units are owned by family businesses, um, private investors, not necessarily other large investment companies, some of them are. But those smaller um, family-owned, family business, family office companies that own these properties many times do not have their own transition plan, okay? So if mom owns 20 apartment buildings and she's 88 years old and she has no estate plan and there's no succession plan for her kids to take over even though they have been um, but it has to be documented then it's a shame but it could definitely um, ruin the the company right it, the the holdings would be stuck in probate um, the the kids aren't going to have a whole lot of say if there are if there are no you know documents protecting the the continuity of the company you know, just a, a simple power of attorney, right? Anyway, we were thinking about that because they have a lot of property owners who are getting older. So think about that for your own business, um, you know, because that would affect theirs, right? They would lose a lot of clients if, if all of these properties didn't actually have a good continuity plan. And so think about your own continuity plan. And if you've got customers and clients that are getting older um, and that, that their continuity plan would affect your own, um, it would be a good time to have a conversation about that. And it's interesting that you talk about that, the, the acquisition piece, because six months ago, if Julie would have said this to me, I would have been like, you know, knowing the size of my business and kind of where we're at and growth. It's like, I can't think about acquiring anybody else. Like we're, we're building what we're building. And just this la end of last week, somebody approached me that's ready to be done. Yeah, there you go. And it really aligns to our business. And I'm like, holy crap, what I do in an acquisition right now? And I think we think of acquisition having to be this huge thing and we have to have this huge business to acquire another huge business. And no. that's not necessarily the case, no. right? And especially if you get involved with somebody early where maybe they've got three or four years that they want to slowly exit and you can come on. So I, when Julie says this, it's like most people go, yeah, I'm not even at that point, but you'd be surprised what's out there and, and what the pandemic has done to a lot of business owners or single proprietors that are just like, you know, I don't know that I want to write out the next crisis, right? They're just kind of at that point in life where they want to be done. And, and I think we do need to be looking for those things because it's a great way to grow without it having to be all organic, right? Yeah. And to diversify. And that's the other piece here that we're seeing in a lot of our clients. So um, big general contractor out of South Dakota, and we just had this conversation a couple weeks ago, they're heavy in healthcare and higher ed. They've built a $200 million company, heavy in healthcare and higher ed. They're very successful at what they do. They are looking at the trends going, higher ed's not going to be higher ed the way it was before, right? And, and really, the trends have been there for the past couple years as you look at the college numbers and MBA programs that are shutting down. And so they're making a huge pivot, which is a big deal for their business because they've been around for a really long time. But they were looking at their diversification and saying, this won't last the next 10 years, right? We're not in the right industries. We've got to look at those industries that are now booming because of what's happening. And we've got to think about how to pivot in that because we're good at what we do, right? It's just entering a new, new industry. And I think it's scary for a lot of businesses, but I think it's an absolute necessity to be diversified. And if anybody learned anything during this, um, the more diversified you were, um, probably the better you, that you fared, right? From an industry standpoint um, and that perspective. So definitely something um, to think about with your team and to really go into the details on, because I think it's gonna, it's gonna drive a whole different level of engagement and conversation with your teams as well. 
diversification. We just talked about this. Um, but the important thing here is, as I look back on my business, right, seven years ago, I remember people telling me, find a niche, serve an industry, a type of, I mean, I even had somebody say like, go after dental clinics <laughs> and help them grow. And I was like, really? Like, because everyone believed that you, if you were super niched, right, you just would have a, a hold on that industry. Well, I'll tell you what, the last year, I'm really, really happy that we weren't diversified because my profits are going to be up 60% this year in the midst of COVID. And I don't share that to impress you. I share it to impress upon you. It's only because of diversification. We have clients that have hired 30 people in the last month. And we have hospitality clients that are still working with us, but have laid off half their staff, right? So we, and everything in between. And so when you think about diversification, it is such a crucial element going forward, I think in the new normal, because we're gonna continue to have instability in certain industries and it's gonna change, right? And it's gonna adjust. So making sure that you're really thinking about that and it takes a while to build some of that diversification, but it's something that's really, really important. So Julie, I'm gonna have you talk about the values gap. Absolutely. Um, just one comment real quick on diversification. I just wanted mm -hmm. to give you another idea. Um, a couple of my clients in the construction industry are doing this right now where mm -hmm. they've got field crews, right? Um, they're in a seasonal, sometimes cyclical business and they're trying to keep everybody busy in the okay. field. Um, some, there's a couple of them actually that have got some certifications and some specialties that most of their competition doesn't have. One of the companies that I work with is actually going to take and package those maintenance and repair services that they can do on their own properties to other companies that don't already have those kinds of people that have to farm it out and hire people to come in, which is getting more and more difficult to find people that you can even hire you know, um, as a contractor to come in and do some of this work. So there's that. Um, there's another company that I work with that is a steel erection company and they've been collaborating. We talked about collaboration. So think about collaboration when you think about diversification. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to start because it protects you from, you know, dump, ju jumping in um, both feet, right? You got a date for a while, walk with it, see if it works, make sure your values are aligned. Um, but they're adding crane service and some rebarring service. And so that's going to be able to expand the kind of jobs that they're able to do. And they already have the people on board with certifications to be able to do that work. So those are just some diversification ideas for you. Okay, um, closing the value gap. This is uh, something that we could probably talk about for a couple of days, but we don't have time to do that. So I think that it's um, probably reasonable to say that many um, going concerns out there, the ones that are still a going concern, have noticed or, or, um, or realized that they've got a gap in the value of their company, uh, where it was prior to the pandemic, where it is now. The important thing, I think, if you're not sure what it is, but you know it's there, is to just find out. Just find out. Um, you know, um, True up your numbers, get your financials in order, have your accounting firm get them normalized, um, meaning you know, backing out some of the business or expenses that you have the business pay, um, making sure that you're paying yourself enough, right? And then uh, see, based on what your accounting firm can tell you, what kind of range of value you're looking at today. You got to know where you are today. You got to know. You know, maybe we don't want to know. We'd rather just, you know, bury our head in the sand. And I totally get that. But we're not going to be able to decide and plan for where we're going until we know where we are right now. So some of the things that, that help to close that value gap, like we talked about before, we're making strategic acquisitions. Um, and that's not as easy as it sounds, okay? Does it seem like a simple solution? Sure. Um, it could be a simple solution. However, there's a lot that goes into that. And it isn't just about the numbers. You have to know that when you bring two companies together, regardless of the size of the company, that the integration process is essential. And most companies that come together in a merger or an acquisition, um, the integration process fails. And you maybe have been through that. Like you've maybe been a customer of one that was merged or acquired with another company, say for instance, a bank. Um, and things were pretty rocky for a while and maybe they're still rocky. So um, it is, like I said, it's not just about the numbers, but it can be a quick way 
for you to be able to close a value gap as long as it makes sense from all the angles. You want to make sure that the culture is a match. You want to make sure that the numbers make sense. Um, maybe they've got capabilities, markets that you don't have that would definitely complement what you're already doing. I have two clients that went through that in 2019 and 2020, and it took them a few shots, okay, at the table before they actually were able to close. The biggest deterrent for why they were not able to close on those transactions was the seller um, didn't like the deal, and they were totally unrealistic about what their business is worth, okay, very common. So that's why I want you to know what your business is worth. Um, you know, buck up, <laughs> get it done, and so that you know where you're going and, and, um, and if the pandemic has affected you or not, because it maybe hasn't, but it's got to be for the right reasons. Perfect. And then the last piece of resiliency is really assessing the need for change. And, and, and take that opportunity, right, to really change. And, and what we're seeing with our clients is the change can happen in a lot of different areas, right? Your core processes and how your company is run. This is one of the biggest areas we're seeing business leaders assess their need for change. Like as someone who's been pushing this for so many years with our clients, they finally get it because they're, they're seeing profit erosion because they've taken the covers back, right? They aren't just stumbling on money and able to grow and just keep the company running is they're having to take a really hard look at how well do we actually run the company? Not how well do we make money, but how well do we run the company? Um, and so it's been a real eye opening for them, but really promising for the future scalability of a lot of these businesses. And that's what I mean by being ready to run um, when things start to change, taking a new approach to talent and skills. Probably one of the biggest discussions for all of our clients is assessing people in a different way, right? They saw leaders who were born during this time and who stepped up that they never saw, they never knew. And then they saw some leaders that didn't step up to the challenge during this time. And, and so really assessing that and what do we need going forward and how have those skills or that talent and what we require changed and being honest with ourselves because the people component is usually the hardest one to change, but it now is the time to really be assessing that um, and making sure we were set up right with the right foundation uh, for the future. Um, culture. I, we all know this, when we went remote, right, cultures are struggling right now, but the biggest question I get is how do we manage a remote culture? The answer is the same way you managed it in person with just different approaches, but you're still doing the same types of things. Like people think that we have to change everything. If you had a strong culture before, I can guarantee you your culture is still pretty strong. We've just had to adjust how we engage them. If you had a weak culture before, you probably were exposed when everybody went remote. It's just the way it is. And so it's getting real around how we need to reboot our culture and how our mindsets in our organizations have to change. Um, innovation. And when I say innovation, I don't mean Elon Musk type of crazy innovation. I mean day-to-day -day customer journey, employee journey, right? Products and services. How are we thinking differently? And not just we, meaning at the top, how are we engaging our people? differently in, in this conversation. We have done more innovation sessions with companies in the last six months than in the last two years. And the reason being is we're calling them and saying, you gotta get the ideas out on the table. The people on the front line are seeing something different with the customer than you are, right? Executive at the top. And it's been eye-opening for a lot of these businesses to get these great ideas and have this idea exchange and the collaboration that Julie talked about earlier can be really powerful going forward because we've opened up the door then for our people to constantly be bringing these ideas forward because we're asking them different questions and we're asking them to think differently. And we've got a lot of talent on our teams that aren't necessarily being maximized in that way. We talked about decision making. You have to be able to make decisions quicker than we did in the past. Um, and not all decisions, there's a risk level here, but the businesses that are gonna get left behind are the ones that are gonna go, oh, I don't know if we should do this. I don't know if it's right. Figure out how to make that decision, right? Bring the team around you, bring advisors around you to help you get to a decision. And then really examining your products and services, right? If there's nothing wrong with changing, it doesn't mean what you were doing before was wrong or that you failed in some way. And as women, let's be honest, that's how we feel, right? When we, we have to pivot or we have to do something different is something must have been broken before. Nope. It just, the world has changed around us and we have to change. 
And if we're going to dig in our heels and say, we believe what we've always done is going to work in the future, we're going to get left behind. And that's, you know, Julie and I working with clients, it's, that's the one thing we don't want to see is we don't want to see businesses, especially women-owned businesses, get left behind in this. So you've really got to assess your, your, the need for change and where your, your team, right, is open to that change. So we're a little over halfway through. We wanted to just kind of open it up for Q&A here before we kind of go into some of the strategies. And just if there's things that are you know, bothering you, things you're dealing with, things we can help with, either Julie or I or the rest of the folks on the call, any questions so far? I have a question, of course, yeah. <laughs> um, for either one of you, but you know, we talk a lot about growth and ways to you know, get creative, maybe um, look at new markets, new opportunities. How does that play into profitability? You know, um, I, I've seen a lot of my clients and in some cases even ourselves, maybe take on some work that we may not have otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and it's that balance of, you know, do we take it on, even if it's lower profit margins, because we're building that relationship. So how, how do you manage through profitability during this crazy time, at, you know, as well? So one piece, and then I know Julie's probably got some good examples here. So one thing that we're, the conversation we're having with clients is I'm calling them growth guardrails, right, is in this time, right, we still have payroll to pay. And so we, we're not going to turn away. Maybe we look at opportunities that we wouldn't look at in the past. Not ideal target market, maybe margins not as high. But if you go into that, being really honest with yourself to say, we're making this decision, but next year, hopefully we wouldn't make the same decision. It, there's some growth guardrails in there. Now, the margin is what's important because you don't want to take a bunch of like, a pain in the ass client, right? Or a bunch of work that isn't, it's going to erode your margin. So you've got to make sure that you feel like you can maintain it at a certain level, even if it's slimmer than what you would normally do. I just had this conversation with a client yesterday where they're looking at their numbers for 2020 and they're like, you know, our, our gross profit margin for the year is way below what we want it to be because we took two big pieces of work because we had to right? Because we wanted to keep people employed. And they're like, we would never do that in 2021. And we expect that margin to go back up. So Mary, I think part of it is giving yourself some grace and saying, yeah, we can do this, but we're eyes wide open about it, right? And we know that it's not ideal and we've got to protect the margin as much as we can. But let's be real, right? We still have to be able to pay the bills and, and keep the business going. And, and the biggest thing is keeping people employed. So I think it's a delicate balance but just making sure that you're being honest with yourself that that's not going forward, that's not target market, right? Or what we want to be doing. I think that if it's a long-term client that you have an, an engagement with or an agreement with that you work with on a regular basis, if they're asking um, and they need help and you want to retain them, um, you know, there's a little bit of give maybe that you could, could um, allow for, but you got to know what your minimums are, right? Um, when it comes to cutting prices, I've never been a fan of that. Um, but, but, if, but say, for instance, you have a package of services and um, you know, based on your research, that your customers and clients are looking for something that's a little more cost effective based on where we're at today. So instead of, you know, reducing your profit margin, maybe you just reduce the number of services that are included in that package. And you, and you charge the same amount of money. That way you're not losing money. Um, they're still getting something that they can afford. I actually have done that with um, some of my workshops. I just don't include the same amount of content. Um, I don't uh, I'll give as many tools away, um, but they're still getting a lot of good content and it makes sense for them price point wise. Any other questions before we jump into strategies? Okay, we'll have time at the end too, if any come to mind. So the second part of this discussion is, is not the, you know, sky is falling, right? The reality of what's going on and the things we need to change in our business, but some strategies to, as you rebuild value in your business, right? What, how do we create that solid foundation and how do we build on it and, and be prepared to rebuild that value and rebuild the growth as we navigate, right? This road ahead. So we've got six strategies total that we're going to talk about and walk you through. 
Julie, you can take the first one. Sure. So strategies to rebuild value really starts with a foundation of having a good, strong team. Okay, we kind of talked about that before. I know I brought up collaboration. Truly, um, collaboration is kind of in and a part of our economy. We're in a collaborative economy right now. And for the, the people that sign up for that and understand that and look for ways that they can collaborate, they're going to be the ones that are going to be able to thrive. Um, being able to, to do things together, um, if you want to call it divide and conquer, you know, what we're doing right now is a collaborative effort, right? Between Jamie's company, my company, and Navo, it's a collaborative effort. We all are separate entities, um, but we're working together to try to get a message out that we feel is important, um, not just because we want to grow our companies, but because we really care about the work that we do and the mission that we have. And being able to get this message out is huge. So think about that with your own organization and think about who those ambassadors could be that aren't already. Um, you know, for whatever reason, a lot of times people think that an ambassador is somebody kind of on the outside who's, you know, milling around and telling people about how wonderful the company is. Well, there's that, right? You got your business development people. Um, but what about your financial advisor, your CPA, your, your, um, you know, your insurance agent, the people that you do business with on a regular basis? How are they helping you um, get the word out on your company? You know, you're doing business with them. How are they helping you to you know, to bring it back and to make introductions and saying good things about your business. It doesn't take much to make a strategic introduction. Uh, the people that are internal, your key people, when they're out and about and everybody's got a life, you know, we're not getting out as much as we used to, for sure. But, um, but what do they have to say about your company? What are they telling people? Do they even know what to say? And, and sometimes it's just a matter of knowing what to say about your company and looking for opportunities. I just think that anybody who works for a company, your company, anybody, regardless of what their role is, they all can affect sales. And I think that right now, um, top line sales for a lot of people is, is down. So what can we do to affect top line sales? We can bring our team together, make sure that they know what to say about our company, perhaps even reward them for bringing in an opportunity that they stumbled across because they said something, right? Instead of saying nothing. And, and I think that there's a lot of low hanging fruit out there. So we wanna be able to utilize the, the, um, the relationships that we have, not just our advisors, not just our internal team, um, but also our organizations. You know, if we're a part of organizations like NABO, um, especially if we're in a leadership position or on a committee, those are some really close colleague relationships that all you gotta do is ask. You know, who do you know? Um, how, how, can you, how can we help each other, right? So again, it kind of goes back to that collaboration conversation. And one thing just to add to this that has really helped me, and I had this realization about two and a half years ago, is I was building the business and building my network, and I started to realize that there were two different groups of people that I was coming in contact with. People that were advocates of my business and me, and people that were ambassadors. And when I made the realization that they were two different people, um, that's where I was able to manage my energy a little bit better. So advocates, the way I describe them is if they're in a meeting or they're networking with somebody and that person brings up my name as like, we're thinking about working with Keystone or do you know Jamie? And we've heard she could really help us. And that person is like, absolutely, right? They're an advocate for me. They, they, they talk about me in, in, in a good light. An ambassador, in that same conversation, if the person said, hey, I'm looking for uh, someone to help us with our strategy, an ambassador would say, just call Jamie, mm -hmm. right? An advocate wouldn't necessarily say that. An advocate might give them three names. They would never speak badly of me. They know my work. They would, but an ambassador takes it one step further. And so I realized I was spending like 80% of my time on a bunch of advocates. Mm -hmm. And not that I don't want those people, but what I want is five or six ambassadors that are like preaching my, like, just call her. You don't need to call anybody else, right? Or she'll help you think through this. Just give her a call. And so it, I think it's sometimes compartmentalizing, especially as women, because we just, we're not workers and we know we're emotionally intelligent. And we just want to help everybody, but not everybody's an ambassador and that's okay. But it's knowing where to put your energy, especially right now, right? And, and to get back in that growth. So really finding those people. 
Um, the next piece that we've, we've kind of talked about, but it's just be open to change. And I feel like a broken record here, but I really want this to hit home is that it's not a failure if you have to adjust your business right now, if you have to switch gears or switch strategies. It is a new world and everybody is reassessing, right? The biggest, most successful businesses are trying to reassess right now. So there's two big pieces that you need to think about in, in being open to change. The first one is what is changing for our customers, right? What are the issues that are different or new that they're dealing with? What's that customer journey and that customer experience feel like and look like? So really answering that and being open to change that and adjust it if needed. And then what have we learned about our business that could really use an adjustment? And I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with um, the chief marketing officer for a very large business in town, a very well-known business that shall not be named. And she said they went through this summer and this pandemic exposed so many bad things in their business, her words. And they had two choices to make, right? Do we want to really address them or do we want to just keep moving? right? Because we're, they were, they're a public company. And what do you think they chose? They chose to just keep moving, right? Like, let's just plow forward. Let's not really address what we've learned. And there's a lot of businesses out there right now. And as we talked about today is it, you either get real or it's going to be painful later. And so if things aren't working, if things aren't as solid as we thought they were, now is the time to be looking at those. And, and that's right. Our plea is just be open to that and don't feel as though it's a failure. It's an evolution of kind of where you're at. Okay, so we talked a little bit about decision making earlier. And um, I think just, you know, to expand on decision making, I think I'm just going to revert back to my recommendation about utilizing your advisors and your key people in making decisions because some of the decisions that we have to make are pretty tough. And we really need to assess when we have a decision to make, um, who it's going to affect, um, and, and to, to picture how, how it's gonna affect our business. Sometimes it's a decision that's not so popular. Um, sometimes it's a big decision that could actually help us to grow, but we do have to weigh all of the possibilities, right? How, how is this gonna help us? How could it hurt us? What's a worst case scenario if we move forward with this? What's the best case scenario? You gotta know both. Right, and, and you can't have all the lights be on green in order to move forward. You're, you're gonna have some obstacles. Um, that's just the way it is, right? And so enough information to make a decision is important. And then utilizing the help of people around you to help validate maybe how you might be look, looking at it or how you might be feeling. Because you know we do sometimes let our emotions get in the way and we all have our own filter. We all have our own um, issues with confidence in terms of where we feel like we do our best work. And if we're in a space where we're not comfortable or we're not familiar, then we might second guess the decision that we're making. And that's why we need to have other people around us. But you know, women are so good at intuition. We're so good at knowing what our gut tells us to do. Follow your gut, do the best that you can, follow your gut, move forward, um, and, and when you're making changes and when you're making decisions, focus on things that drive value. Think about the things that drive value in your business when you're making your decisions. Just incorporate that conversation into the decisions you're making. You know, like Jamie talked about the improvements that you could be making to your business. All right, well, what are they? You know, do you need new systems? Do you need to upgrade your software? Do you need to add salespeople? Do you need a sales process? Do you need to um, integrate your programs? Do you need more cybersecurity? Do you need better marketing? I mean, marketing, <laughs> that's usually a pretty big thing with just about every client that I work with. It's kind of um, ad hoc many times, um, it's not monitored, so we really don't even know if there's ROI. So, so examine that, examine your brand. Your brand message is huge right now. Brand is everything right now. Your uh, reputation with your customers, clients, and vendors is very important, and your brand speaks volumes. So make sure that whatever you're doing is, um, is consistent and that your message out there is clear, um, that you provide value, and what kind of value is it? Like, how, what's in it for me? And, and, and how, how is it that I should be trusting you? Trust is everything. So think about those things that build value. Those are some of them. 
There are a lot of other ones that we don't have time to talk about today. Um, but when we talk about closing that value gap, we want to go with the lowest hanging fruit. And to Jamie's point where she was talking with the client that said, wow, this pandemic really revealed a lot about what we need to do to improve our business. That's a huge opportunity. You know, you could take a SWOT analysis and look at a coin and you got weakness on one side, you got opportunity on the other side. So every weakness is an opportunity to grow and improve. And I think that that's the best way to look at it. And one other piece of advice that I'm giving a lot of specifically women business owners, I've had this conversation around decision making is what I call channeling your beginner's mindset is remember when you started your business, you were a little naive, you were a bit more of a risk taker, right? You clearly left something that was probably safer to do something new. I think right now we got to go back to that a little bit and not in a way that introduces a ton of risk, but that beginner's mindset is just that, well, I haven't fallen hard yet. So I, you know, it doesn't quite hurt. I don't know how bad it could hurt, but your thing, anything new that we do, when you're a beginner at it, you don't actually know what a fool you might look like. So you're just like, all right, we'll do this and try it. And I think we're at that point that, that we need to channel some of that, that beginner mindset again with a lot of our businesses and not be afraid of, hey, if it doesn't work, then we'll just pivot again, right? We've done it before. So I think it's sometimes getting over that in our heads is the biggest thing. Getting back to the excitement, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then we've talked about improvement and, and Julie just talked about this too, is right now, especially if things feel a little bit slower or maybe they don't, maybe they're crazy and they're, they're growing, but now is the time to look at processes, to look at your people. How can you train them? What can you delegate to be prepared, right? For when things turn, um, what systems do you need in place that you don't need today? We've been talking about a CRM for a year. Now's the time to do it, right? We've got a little extra time. And it's going to help us again be able to run when everything is ready to go. So focus on improvement and what you can control right now for your mental health, for your team's mental health, right? And for your own growth of your business, because there's a lot we can't control. And as human, need, as human beings, we have human needs around certainty and being able to control some level of our lives and things in our lives. Your business is what you can control inside. And so double down on that. And I think it's going to reap rewards in the future for sure. And focusing on um, what you really want is super important, right? Um, needs and wants are not the same thing. Um, if you've never done a needs wants analysis on yourself and what you really um, envision for the future, now would be a really good time for you to do that. You, you know, your business is supposed to serve you. It's, you're not supposed to be um, a slave to it, although that can happen many times. Um, but just really understanding that your personal values and the things that you really want, the dreams that you have for your future, um, need to be supported by your business, right? So the, the personal values that you have should align with the values that you've articulated for your business. You shouldn't have, who has time to live two lives anyway, right? <laughs> Nobody. And so that's why I say that the value alignment should really be there. And if you've never done a needs wants analysis, it's just a very simple exercise. In fact, um, I know Nicole Middendorf is on the call today and I'm sure that she does an exercise like this all the time with her clients. So I'm sure that she would be happy to walk you through um, how she does it from a financial perspective because so much of what we really need and want involves having money um, and planning our money right and 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 not everything but but a lot of things are it sure helps to have so i was thinking about um that you know how how do i want to expand my business and what do i really want from a business right we all have this mission we all have a purpose we all have our values in line and and mine is just to help business owners to maximize the the positive outcome of the transition of their business whenever that happens and to do whatever i can to get them ready now so that if opportunity knocks or if something happens, they've got contingency planning in place and it doesn't all come unraveled. Because who wants to work their entire life for a nest egg to have it blow up in their face because they weren't ready? So know what you want, know what you need. They're not the same thing. Um, and, and I'll defer to, to Nicole and you guys can ping her to put something together because it's, it's essential. And the last strategy is truly never stop dreaming. 
And what we mean by this is your business will continue to face crises. This will not be the last one that we face. It's probably not the first one for most of us. It's maybe just a greater magnitude. But crisis and fear should not change what we are working towards, right? They shouldn't change our goals, right? Our dreams are still there. Our goals for our business, our goals for our exit, as Julia talked about, are still there. The path just might look different. And so what I don't want and what I see in some business owners right now is we're in this place of fear and we're letting that control where we're at instead of having kind of the faith, right? As an act of courage, having the faith that we're going to figure this out because we've figured it out before, right? We've figured it out every single time up to this point. And the worst thing we can do is to live in fear for our business. And there's a Les Brown quote that I keep close, especially right now, that talks about too many of us are not living our dreams because we're living our fears. We're truly manifesting the things we don't want because we're in such crisis mode. And so you have to make sure that we have optimism. You know, what if, as hard as it is to say right now with everything that's going on is what if this was supposed to happen? What if it was supposed to happen for our business? How are we reacting to that, right? And are we ready for what it was supposed to build in our business? And that's really what, we wanted you to get out of today for Julie and I, because that is our purpose is to, to expose, right? Turn the mirror and have you really look at things differently. Um, and hopefully this has helped you. I want to open it up here for questions before we get there. And I know it's on your worksheet as well is Julie and I have been collaborating and we're going to do a four session series much deeper than what we've done here um, starting in January. Um, and we're kind of doing this as a pilot group. We may do multiple next year, but just looking for six to eight women that kind of want to go a bit deeper in their business and talk through some of these things and solve and, and get that perspective. Um, so if you have more information, if you think there are women that aren't on this call that have, that are interested, all you have to do is send an email and we'll kind of get you, we'll get on a call with you and kind of figure out if it's something that will help. So we want to make sure that you guys have that information. And then here's how you can connect with us. Um, social media all over the place. Um, great information and content. I know Julie puts out. Um, we both also have podcasts. If you're not already listening to them, some of you on the call have already been on my podcast and I think we'll be on, on Julie's. So we're, we're definitely promoting women and their success and what's going on right now. So with that, Julie, if you have anything else you want to add at the end here, we'll open it up for questions. I will just quickly check the chat. Mm -hmm. No questions in the chat. Is there anything else you guys want to discuss or you, you, we can help with? We've wowed them to silence, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no worries. I um, do have a, uh, we had a few questions that were submitted ahead of time, but just given the time frame, maybe we can, um, when you follow up with uh, your information, we could answer a few of those questions. Yeah, for sure. Sure. I can do that. Absolutely. All well, right. this, this was fantastic. Um, boy, I, I'm going into a, a quarterly planning session tomorrow. And so it really helped shift my mindset a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm excited for that. So thank you so much. Um, this was invaluable. Hey, Mary. I think we had till 930. I think we had a little extra time or did we change it? Well, I wasn't yeah. sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, um, but we can hang on here a little bit. Um, to say if you had a question, um, I thought we had time, but if not, we can do it the other way too. We had originally booked it till 9.30 and then changed it to nine. Oh, okay. Uh -oh. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so. Just wanted to let everybody know that um, I will be sending a survey out. So if you could uh, give us your feedback on the program, that would be great. And then also we have, um, uh, excuse me there, um, I will be sending a link out to the recording of this and then also the slide deck. So um, you'll watch your emails for that. So you'll be seeing that uh, in the next few hours here. So. Perfect. Super. You can reach out if Julie or I can help. You just need somebody to talk to. We're both open for that. So don't hesitate. Sounds great. Thank you all for participating. We appreciate it.
And watch, we've got a program coming up with Excel and WBDC, a, a partnership program on innovation. So you'll be getting information on that shortly. So thank you all and have a wonderful day.